Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, do you remember that scene in Godfather 3? Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. It kind of feels like the whole world is like that right now, doesn't it, with the whole corona, COVID thing going on. And just when I thought that my break in dreamy Santorini in September might happen, things are beginning to look uncertain again. But hey, first world problems, right? Because as you all know, COVID-19 has left healthcare providers in dire need of support, both on the front lines and back of house. And call centres, for example, are seeing up to 10 times increase in volume. So in response, health systems like Jefferson Health Memorial Health and Banner Health over in the US have quickly turned to technology, but more specifically, chatbots. And a company called Lifelink is putting chatbots on the map at the moment because of how they're leveraging its unlimited capacity to pre-screen and schedule appointments for patients. But this sudden need has almost pushed chatbots into the mainstream. And the role that they're playing now is actually almost transformed overnight. So after reading about this emerging trend, I wanted to learn more about chatbots' new mission-critical role in the healthcare system and what that means for the new normal of healthcare. So I invited Lifelink's Greg Kiefer onto the podcast and thankfully he said yes. So buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to San Francisco so we can speak with Greg now. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Greg. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Sure. Yes. Hi. Thanks for having me on. Um, so, yeah, I'm the chief marketing officer at Lifelink, which is a technology company uh, focused on healthcare chatbots, which I think we'll be talking a little bit more about later. I'm actually not a um, healthcare career person. There's a lot of people in this industry that are lifers in healthcare. I actually got my start uh, in a consumer advertising agency and spent 12 years learning about consumer behavior, kind of in the pre-internet days, you know, where it was more about branding and less about clicks. And uh, then moved over to a startup in supply chain, um, you know, global trade, and kind of helped a company from startup stage through a $700 million acquisition in 2015. And we really took over the whole notion of intercom, global commerce and and trade and, and using technology to track goods. And um, so that that experience, you know, was a, di- a disruption where an industry went through a, a quantum shift. You know, when we when I started there, this thing called China as a manufacturing hub was just starting. And this thing called cloud computing was also just starting. And the convergence of those two macro things is where our company was focused. And over the course of 15 years, uh, it became something that was a, a side project to uh, a central need for every major company on the planet to be able to see their goods as they moved around the world so they could be smart when pandemic struck or to tsunamis hit, uh, where they could respond and not run out of supply or uh, goods on retail shelves. So um, I feel like I'm repeating it now in healthcare. I've been at it for a couple of years here, but uh, so far so good. And so my job is marketing at the company. I am responsible for all aspects of that and strategy and uh, just trying to get the industry to understand new ways of thinking about how to engage patients with technology. And we're both men of a certain age that remember that pre-internet age there. So I'm curious, what was it that first got you into technology? Can you remember the the, the spark there that that obviously put you on the path to where you are now? Well, uh, you know, this is going to sound terrible. Um, I was fascinated by technology and what was happening. And I live in Silicon Valley area. So, you know, we were right at the ground zero where you had all of these big companies like Cisco and HP and Apple that are kind of old companies now. And it was the dot-com boom. You know, the, everybody I knew was a paper millionaire. And I had a decent job at the ad agency I was working at. I liked it, but it was time for a change. And I got an offer to come to a startup. And I thought, oh, I'll do that and, and, and be a gazillionaire in, in two years, right? Like everybody was. And, um, but I was also fascinated with doing marketing on the client side. And I thought that I was really fascinated 
by the supply chain. You know, it was something you just don't think about. You know, when you walk into a Walmart and look around at all the stuff that's in there, it's just incredible what goes into doing that, to making that happen. You know, how the merchandise changes over five, six times a year for seasonality. And it really was fascinating to me how that whole machine, the underbelly of the, of the world, of the world, you know, world commerce, uh, works, you know, planes and ships and warehouses and all the technology and people that's required to make a store uh, be, you know, meaningful to people that want to shop or to have a factory that, that needs all of the parts to arrive at the right moment to be assembled into a car, for example. I was really fascinating. So I really, really uh, got into it. And of course, I was a staunch believer in cloud uh, because, you know, at the time it was all licensed and installed software. And then you had this whole new model emerging where you rent technology and versus buying it. And of course, all the risk was no longer on the buyer, but the deliverer had to make deliver a product that worked or the, the, their customers would stop subscribing, right? So that was a really interesting dynamic as well. So the fusion of those two things was really cool and interesting. So the the millionaire overnight thing kind of went away when we actually had to kind of hunker down and build a real business. But I I just really uh, loved uh, the time and that ride uh, building that company up. Fantastic. And of course, here we are in 2020. And for people that are hearing about LifeLink for the very first time, can you tell me a little bit more about exactly what it is and the kind of problems that you're solving for businesses with technology? Yeah, sure. So yes, we are a technology company and um, we are focused on healthcare. And the really, the, the I'd say the fundamental problem or challenge that our technology is designed to solve is what we call patient engagement. You know, and all of us go to the doctor and know what that's like. And the technologies that the hospital industry and the, and the medical, all medical industries have deployed to kind of interact with people are a full decade behind what we get with Amazon or, or some of the uh, banking apps that we use. And so the, and this is a real problem. This is a real challenge because the hospital industry has invested billions of dollars in big systems of record to digitize all of our health records. You know, the I don't know in the UK, but in, here in America, when you used to go to the doctor, there was a wall of manila folders behind the reception desk that had all of our files in it, right? And they've spent the last 20 years digitizing all that, which is great, but they have not been able to successfully uh, extend that technology into the hands of consumers. Yes, they've bought app, built apps, they've set up portals, but there's a lot of friction involved. So LifeLink um, is building conversational chatbot technology, which is um, interactive, um, mostly through message-based interactions. It's not an Alexa type of thing, but more using messaging to talk patients through different processes we call workflows related to, navigate, related to navigating their healthcare. And that could be everything from uh, scheduling an appointment with the doctor to uh, being informed when you're in the emergency room to being part of a clinical study for a COVID vaccine. And these are all things that they need patients to uh, interact with technology, typically through a mobile device, because that's where it's all headed, obviously. And in a low friction way, right? Because chatbots don't require you to download an app, for example. They work through SMS and web browsers, which are native on a phone. Uh, You don't have to remember a password to get into secure uh, HIPAA compliant information exchange. So these things um, are what, these things represent a huge opportunity to get patients into the digital realm, which will ultimately, you know, make the system more efficient and more cost effective for everybody. So we're focused on large hospitals, um, pharmaceutical companies, and clinical research studies. That's kind of the areas that we are uh, driving towards and it's generally the big guys you know we're going after multi-billion dollar companies with an enterprise class solution and stack to make all of this work and apologies for asking this but why chatbots what was it that made you go with that and i'm i'm sure it's a question you must get asked a lot right yeah yeah fair amount i mean i think that um as i noted a minute ago um the, the ways that uh, hospitals and pharma companies have really tried to engage their patients 
customers is through mobile apps or web portals. And you know, you're seeing conversion adoption rates of 10%, 15%, 5%, 2%. And that's just not acceptable. That, that is not gonna that is not gonna work um, if you are to, to truly transform the way you run your business. So chatbots, uh, is, you know, there's a lot of different flavors of chatbots, but you know, a chatbot is a is a way of exchanging information through native language conversation. It uh, behaves a lot like the way you text with your friends, and you say, "Hey, honey, what's for dinner tonight?" And he or she says, "You know, pork chops." And you say, "Great, can I, should I get a bottle of wine on the way home?" Yeah, that would be great. What do you want? A chardonnay or a cap? You know that that interaction doesn't require you to learn anything. You know, it doesn't require you to go to a venue and find out what button to push and what wheel to spin, right? So when you think of healthcare, a lot of people are elderly uh, or potentially disabled. Um, they're not in it every single day. Uh, you know, in certain cases, of course, if you've got, you know, a chronic condition, you might have an app that you use every day because you need it. But the vast, vast majority of people go into healthcare and come out of it, you know, once or twice a year, maybe three times a year. So there's a really uh, big friction issue in terms of getting people to use the technology. And so chatbots remove so much of that because you don't need to download something. You don't need to learn anything and you can get in there without remembering a password. And so, you know, when you look at the weak adoption rates and, you know, horrible reviews, you know, we did an assessment of a bunch of large hospitals on Yelp. And the average Yelp rating for hospitals was 2.4 out of five stars, okay? So if that was a restaurant, I don't think you're gonna go eat there, right? And so, and oftentimes we're, we're stuck with that because that's who our doctor is affiliated with. So it's not a great experience. And so if we can get this digital engagement up, the experience will go up as well. And again, we've all experienced this in other industries. I mean, think of banking, right? How, how smooth banking is or how smooth travel is with with apps and technology back from back in the days where you had to make phone calls or walk into banks so that's what we're trying to uh, address and i think the friction dimension with combined with the kind of the language interaction is a, a path to getting those engagement numbers way way up which has to happen and just to bring that vision to life that you've gave us all here today, do you have any real world examples of the chatbot benefits for both healthcare providers and pharmaceutical companies out there just to help people understand the kind of difference that it's making and how it works in their world? Yeah, yeah. Let me give you a couple here. Um, you know, one of the one of the systems, the health systems that we work with in the United States is Banner Health uh, out of Phoenix, Arizona in the U.S., and they're a, they're a $10 billion, 28 hospital system, right, across six states in the Southwest USA. And they, we work with them across a number of different areas. We've got bots that are, that are doing um, uh, ER concierge. We're doing virtual waiting rooms with them. We're doing, um, also doing uh, what we call intake for senior citizens. So in, in, in the United States, as part of the Medicare plan for senior citizens. Uh, seniors are supposed to go see their doctor once a year as part of an annual wellness visit, right? And it's like the classic experience. You'd go in, you'd get handed a clipboard with a bunch of paper forms. They'd have to sit over there and fill out their health history, all their conditions, all their meds. It was a very cumbersome process. And they'd sit there for 20 minutes until the doctor was ready to see them. Sometimes it was 40 minutes. And it was really not a very effective uh, experience in general. So Banner rolled out chatbots to, to, to reach out to seniors a week in advance of their appointments to kind of handle all that intake information ahead of time. We weren't sure if it would work, right? I mean, I'm talking about chatbots. I'm explaining chatbots to you. Um, would senior citizens, people in their 70s, be able to figure this out? And without any advertising campaigns or, or fanfare ahead of time, Banner launched this out um, and people started getting text notifications to, that their annual wellness visit, that their annual wellness visit was coming up, and they were asked to complete the forms and do all of this digitally ahead of time. And it was remarkable what happened because what we saw just out of out of thin air, fifty one percent of people engaged the bot. So, you know, yes, fifty one percent may not sound like a lot. Remember, the standard, the baseline is eight percent, right? So it's a it's a multiple times up in terms of engagement rates. And of that 51%, 99% of them completed the entire process, right? 
And what, the res- what resulted out of that was a huge decrease in appointment cancellations and process efficiency. I think they said that uh, their appointment cancellations dropped by 70%. And that's important because, you know, when, can- when, you- when appointments are being canceled, that's, ca- that's you know, ca- a capacity, a paid capacity that's not being utilized, right? So there- that really begins to add up when you talk about, you know, 30,000, 40,000 appointments a year. Uh, there's a significant value to that uh, opportunity. The other one, uh, health providers, Jefferson Health uh, out of Philadelphia, where it's scheduling appointments online. And then we did an A-B test, their web form versus a chat bot to help people find a doctor and book an appointment. And the bots outperformed the online forums by 150%. So not just a little better, three times better. So those are you know somewhat staggering numbers when you really think about it. And if you apply it to something as big and vast as healthcare across all dimensions, there's immense opportunity. On the pharma side, you know, we work with Roche. I'm sure you know who they are. And one of the big challenges in pharmaceutical med development is information. You know, people and physicians and pharmacists need to, you know, call into a call center or a, or a website PDF to get information about dosing or side effects of a drug. And it's they're they're very clunky. They're very 1990s. Most of them are 37 page PDFs that have more text than you can believe. And so we put a conversational chat bot to serve as an FAQ agent, right? So you could literally type in what are the side effects of whatever ibuprofen. I for, you know I think the drug was called Ocrevus. What are the side effects? And the bot would return. Well, here are here are six or seven you know approved FDA compliant answers on what might, you know, here are approved FDA compliant answers that should provide the insight that the person is looking for. And that got, you know, very high satisfaction. You know, 91% of the people that used it were like, yes, way better. So we're rolling that out, you know, across other pharmaceutical companies because it's a superior way to, to deliver the information that patients want in a compliant way, which is very important in, in pharma, right? Because Everything's regulated. It's very scripted. You can't go off script when you're talking about meds. And of course, one other thing that's huge this year is this global pandemic, which has completely forced healthcare to rethink almost everything. So can you tell me a little bit more about the role that LifeLink has been playing in the fight against COVID-19? Because it's a big time, isn't it, for healthcare at the moment? Yeah, huge, huge. And I think uh, uh, as, as it relates to the chatbot stuff that I've been talking about, it's been incredible. Uh, I, in January, as I was looking at my marketing plans, I thought we probably have another three to five years of work ahead of us to bring chatbots into the mainstream. When COVID flared up in early March, the market matured basically in three years. So overnight, uh, you know, chatbots became something that almost every healthcare system needed as a way to screen patients that thought they had symptoms. And it was incredible because this went from nothing to everywhere in a matter of 45 days. And you've got to realize that these hospital systems are, are not fast innovators. You know, they're, they're, they live in the world of IT steering committees and 18-month and buying cycles for technology, right? So for them to literally stand these things up in 30, 60 days uh, because they were overwhelmed. You know, their, their inbound call centers couldn't handle the volume, so they had to offload uh, a lot of this. And it's since matured. Um, you know, that almost became commodity pretty quick as well. It's, it's not a super complex workflow to screen a patient for conditions. But where we are now, you know, fast forward a few more months, is we're getting into virt- more virtualization of the experience. Um, social distancing is largely driving it, but there's a massive operational lift here that's going to help as the industry recovers from the financial hole that's being created. Um, you know, I saw a report from the American Hospital Association in the U.S. alone, hospitals are losing about $50 billion a month because of COVID right now, because of deferred services, because people are afraid to go. So they've got to virtualize and they've got to do it to reopen. But once you virtualize, there's just immense ROI. So the notion of a virtual waiting room, where that experience I described with the seniors a minute ago, we took that t- same technology and extended it a little more, added, a, added some screener to it, and created this, I'll call it a TSA pre-fast lane. You know, back in the days when we used to travel, 
where you hold patients in their vehicle or outside the office until their exam room is ready, right? So they do all of the advanced form intake work at home on their phone through a chat bot. And then the day of, they're reminded they show up and then they get a text when it's safe to come back and they go straight into the exam rooms. The, so the waiting rooms are gone. I was on the phone with one of, a, one of our clients, which is a large uh, billion dollar medical system. And he said that he will no longer ever make an investment in a physical waiting room again. Um, so it's COVID and beyond, right? Um, and the, the other dimension that's really heating up for us is clinical trials. You know, you see these news stories about these drugs that are being developed to fight the vaccine, you know, to develop a vaccine for COVID. And historically, clinical trials take many years, right? And under the, for obvious reasons, they've compressed it down. But as the trials move into later stages, uh, stages three and four, you know, you've got to recruit populations of patients that number anywhere from 30 to 50 to potentially 100,000 people. And historically, the way clinical trials did that was through email and phone, okay? They don't have the time to do that now. So we are involved in a couple of different trials where the scheduling story that I told you about Jefferson, that module, that capability is being used to recruit and uh, schedule patients into these clinical trials. And the reason we're doing it is because it's high scale. You know, you can, you can outreach to 30,000 people in one day. Uh, if you had a call center, it would take several months to do that, right? So these are some of the things that are moving because of COVID. And I, I, I believe it's here to stay. I don't think when the pandemic goes away, uh, hospitals are going to suddenly revert back to building up you know, waiting rooms and renewing their uh, subscriptions to National Geographic. I think it really is uh, a, the, a kind of a, a moment, if you will, for, for this technology because, yes, you need it now because of the pandemic, but it's going to remain because the, 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 the operational efficiency and cost savings are going to be too good to let go of. And by the way, patients want it too. That's, this is what patients want. This is what they expect that they have yet to get from their healthcare provider. So it's really a win-win. Absolutely. You did mention at the beginning of that question there, back in the days when we could travel. And my last flight that I took was in March when I was coming back from Chicago. And that seems like a lifetime ago. It was only four months, but it seems like a completely different I world, know, doesn't it? I know. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, you know, I, I, it's weird. I, 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 I can't imagine traveling again. I can't look ahead and foresee a time when I'm going to travel. It's so far off. Uh, but yes, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a different time for sure. It really is. And outside of that, I've also read that healthcare providers are, are in dire need of support, both on the front lines and back of house with call centers where they're seeing up to 10x increase in volume. So I've got to ask, I mean, what kind of feedback have you received from customers at LifeLink? Because I would imagine it would make quite a difference at a time when they need it more than ever. Yeah, this is a this is a, a massive uh, zone, if you will. You know, in terms of some of those uh, workflows that I was describing, there's a call center dimension to a lot of them, especially when you get into the pharmaceutical clinical research side of things. And you're right. I mean, it's the call centers were inefficient to begin with, and then when COVID comes along, it you know, as you said, the the, the increase in volume just goes up orders of magnitude. And, you know, I think that there is a there is a tremendous opportunity because, you know, having a, a human agent on a phone at a desk in a facility with a CRM license um, and nine times out of 10 in healthcare, they're right. They're scripted because, you know, again, you can't let somebody freelance unless they're a physician. They're delivering scripted information. Right. So when I think of a call center agent, um, the worst thing is somebody that's reading off of a sheet of paper and you're talking to a human robot. So why not? digitize that, virtualize that person, offload the 80% of the, of the interactions, which are scripted, the same thing over and over, repetitive. You don't need to pay somebody, you know, $18 an hour with health benefits and, and PTO when you can have a bot handle unlimited scale, you know, 100x scale to a call center, right? So if your volume is up 10x, you know, a bot can, can basically offload 80% of the workload from the human team so that they can focus on the kind of the high, the high value corner cases, but of the 80% of the scripted repetitive, you know, what's your name, what's your insurance card? Um, here, here are five common FAQs, things like that. The bot can totally handle that and, and cover a lot of that workload and it can do it 24 by seven. 
You know, I mean, most call centers don't run 24 hours a day. You know, it says, our, here are hours, you know, nine to five Eastern daylight time. And, you know, the other thing about call centers, a lot of, the, a lot of them are doing outbound calling, right, to recruit people, to get people scheduled. I don't know about you, but I don't pick up my phone when a number rings and I don't know who it is. Um, <laughs> exactly. And, so. and so, you know, I've got, I saw, have found some data that U.S. consumers uh, are exposed to 48 billion robocalls a year. Okay. So you're not going to reach any of somebody any, anywhere else yet. Uh, you know, when you look at a, a message from a text, most people, 97% of people respond to a text message within three minutes. Okay. Because it, it, it shows up as text and identifies who it is. And, oh, it's my appointment. They want to confirm that I'm going to show up tomorrow at 2. Click. Yes, I'm, I will be there. Let me know what the directions are or whatever. So I think that the call center model is, is going to completely flip as this technology becomes more and more mature and these use cases get communicated through programs like this. I'm exactly the same there, and I will not answer a call <laughs> and if I don't know that number because hey, if it's important, they'll leave me a message. But if they don't, yeah. that call never gets taken. Yeah, it? you know, it's it's interesting too because one of the things that the, the chatbot will do as part of the setup, if there is a call that's going to happen, uh, like yeah. let's say there's just a dimension where a human does have to call somebody, the bot can say this is the number that it's going to be, and it could actually have you add it to your contacts so you know it's Doctor Smith, right? So they will pick it up. So that's just one of the little moves you can do to improve the yield of the of the outreach. And I'm curious, have you seen market growth this year in conversational healthcare technology? Because from the outside looking in, it feels like it's the perfect moment for it to to thrive. But are you seeing that? Yeah, well, it, it, it was growing. Uh, you know, in most of the reports and studies that come out, you know, had had the you know the industry, if you will, healthcare chatbots, conversational technology, at a 25 to 30 percent growth rate uh you, you know anywhere from two and a half to five billion dollars over the next five years i i think with covid i mean we don't have it's still early it's only been a couple months but i i mean based again based on what i was talking about a second ago i think that that probably is going to have to change um, for us we've already seen a hundred percent increase in in conversational volume uh over numbers last at this time last year and so, um, and, and I would expect that other companies that are doing, are seeing the same thing simply because there is just not enough human capacity right now to handle all of this demand. You know, you've got a classic supply demand dispatch here, and there is no way you can hire your way out of this, especially when an industry like hospitals is losing the kind of money that they're losing there. This is not a, uh, uh, let's hire a thousand more agents to handle all this volume, right? You've got to think of ways to digitize that. And especially when you think about how that's what consumers want. You know, people want to, just like I do online banking through a great app from Wells Fargo Bank, why can't I do online healthcare with, with a great digital assistant from Lifelink, obviously, ideally, but, uh, but from anybody. We're, you know, we're not the only company doing this, but I think it, the market is primed to go. And I think COVID is, is going to energize it. And I, I, I actually think it might be 3 x growth and size based on what those projections had before I, it's still early we'll see how the reports come out later in the year wow and i think we've all seen and, and experienced good and bad chat pops is there is there any uh, big challenges that you have there? Because I think as soon as a, a user or a patient has a, a negative experience with a chatbot or almost knows that it's a chatbot, it, things can take a turn for the worst, don't they? So yeah. how do you overcome challenges like that? Well, you know, I think one of the big uh, challenges and a, and a mistake that lots of uh, chatbot companies, uh, not developers, but buyers are, are making is they're trying to go at it with a, with a like a Siri Alexa yeah. concept. That requires a degree of natural language processing and AI and machine learning that Apple and, and Amazon and, and Microsoft are struggling. Let them figure that out. In the meantime, a messaging-based bot, that, like I've been describing, really does, um, it's designed to deliver outcomes, right? It's designed to help somebody navigate from, I need to see the doctor to a successful appointment with a plan that I got to adhere to. And I really, really think that um, it's 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 a matter of just uh, getting the market to understand the differences. It's not to say that uh, voice won't become mature enough to handle something like healthcare, but 
you know, I like to say it's, you know, when I ask Alexa to play uh, Led Zeppelin, right. And it plays the wrong Led Zeppelin for me, that's okay. Or maybe I get the wrong size of shoes shipped to me uh, in healthcare. You can't have that happen. It could, it could literally kill somebody. Right. So when you're dealing with something like healthcare, that's regulated and, you know, it's obviously vital that you get it right. It really is more about, you know, kind of a scripted guided uh, conversational flow and where the AI is, is what it's, it's bringing, it's bringing the, and presenting the components. I liken it to a jukebox. You know, when you go to a, a bar, when we could go to bars back in the good old days, right? You would go in and, you know, you, 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 it would, it, you play your album from Led Zeppelin or whatever. And maybe the machine learning or the AI knows next time you go in through Bluetooth or something, oh, he's here again. Let's play some Zeppelin and like-minded stuff. So, you know, the jukebox concept in a, in a, in a chatbot is really those albums, those records that have been created and mastered and, you know, edited to perfection. It's really grabbing those conversational sequences that are workflows that are proven. So a scheduling event is a, is a, is a, com- is a component. Um, uh, a QA, an FAQ is a component, right? It, but the thing is that the, what we're not doing is we're not creating the music. We're not having computers create the music yet, the records, because it would be terrible. We would never listen to it. And that's kind of where the industry is right now. But look, it is the beginning of, you know, How 2000 and, and you know, the Holodoc on Star Trek and, you know, we are on that path, but it's still very, very, very early. And I think the market just needs to understand it's not about building the shiny object. It's about building something that delivers a result. Presumably then, do you think we're going to see more digitized waiting room experiences for patients with these conversational chatbots as we continue moving into a a post COVID world? I do. I do. I, you know, we are, um, I mean, when we announced uh, the, the banner health is doing this, we put a press release out. Um, I have yeah, been in marketing now for 30 years. I was astounded <laughs> what happened to our, our website inbox when we made that announcement. I mean, it exploded and it wasn't little, little managers. I'm talking about CIOs and VPs of digital innovation, you know, navigating to our contact us link at the footer of our, of our homepage and say, would somebody please call me? We are interested in, in a virtual waiting room. And this is a billion, two, three, fifteen billion dollar hospital systems, right? So that told me we had lightning in a bottle. And you know, we've got a number of these projects that are now going. And as I said before, I don't see why you would turn that off and go back to paint and chairs and, and magazines. I, I it just doesn't make any sense anymore. And it's not to say that there won't be some sort of a waiting thing, but the concept of a waiting room where you're sitting there shoulder to shoulder, people that are all coughing, right? Waiting for 40, 50 minutes. You know, as this president of this customer said, why would I want to build a place to make people wait? That's just so anti-consumer, right? So I I do think um, the waiting rooms are going to be a thing of the past and, and this will continue on. And looking further into the future, is there anything in particular that excites you about the role that technology will play and also the role that Lifelink will play in that too? Well, I am. I, I think that we. This is this is where it has to go. Um, again, it's not like healthcare just started innovating now. They've been innovating for decades, and you've got to get the patients into the fold. And it's clear that you know there are three hundred and twenty thousand healthcare apps out there, but it's still clear that the future is mobile. You know, we all walk around with a with a with a networked supercomputer in our pockets. And it's everybody. And, you know, and you've got millennials and younger people that are moving into higher care phases in life that don't even want to call anybody. They don't like, you know, making a phone reservation for a restaurant on the phone. They want to use open table. Right. So I think that this is the beginning of, of how it's going to shift. I think that the, the conversational modality is is the future of technology in general. And I think in healthcare, when you look at the waste and the amount of money being spent on it, just a, an incremental improvement can yield hundreds of millions of dollars in value, right? So that, to me, is what's going to really begin to drive it. I mean, it took a pandemic like COVID will kind of supercharge it here for a time. But as more case studies go out and more, it becomes more the norm as opposed to the exception, this is the beginning of, of you know, talking to computers. You just hope that 
they don't become like the Terminator, right? And turn against us. But but it really is um, how where technology is going. I, I wonder if you know we'll have keyboards and mice much longer. You know, I, I think that could be something that goes away down the road. Well, so much food for thought in our conversation today. And for anyone listening that would like to continue that conversation, can you remind them the best place of finding you online, contacting your team, or even, I believe, listen to your own podcast, which I believe is Digital Conversations. Yes. About that. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, my name's Greg Kiefer, K E F E R. Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn uh, or at lifelink.com, which is our website. Um, and yeah, my podcast show is called Digital Conversations. Then I'm the host, so I'm normally in your seat, so we've reversed. So I might have to have you on my show, actually. That would be oh, uh, kind of fun. But, um, yeah, I, I, am, uh, I would love to talk to any of you. If you want to uh, ping me, uh, you can reach me in those channels. My, my email is gkeefer, K-E-F-E-R, at lifelink.com. I'm not sure if that would be like crossing the streams or entering Bizarro World if we did that, but I'd be up for it anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'm game if you are. <laughs> Absolutely. Man. All right, cool. And like you said, we've all got that network supercomputer in our pocket now, and I think it's so important to have these com- these conversations about conversational healthcare tech, and it's a subject that I really think you've brought to life today. So a big thank you for taking the time to come and share that with me today. It's been a pleasure. My big takeaway from this conversation is that people aren't only texting friends and family. 90% of people also want to text businesses or the people that they're dealing or the companies that they're dealing with the most. And as a result, healthcare providers that augment human expertise with text based communications could very well transform the patient experience. And most importantly, they're doing it on the platform that each unique consumer prefers all on their smartphones. Essentially, they're meeting patients where they are with a conversation. And something about that really intrigues me, excites me, makes me very hopeful about the future. But over to you. I mean, what are your thoughts on everything that we've talked about today? Uh, As always, you can email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk where you'll find links to all my social channels if, if you want to send me a DM on those. Whatever it is, you should find a way to contact me nice and easy. So have a think, send me a message. And if you don't, don't worry, I'm still going to persist and ask you every day to send me a message. But I will return tomorrow with another guest. So thanks for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.